All right, this is a beef short loin. Um, this is the primal that is located right behind the ribeye. Uh, and you, one way of distinguishing that is this is the 13th rib. And actually when the animal's hanging upside down from its gamble cord, what they'll do is they'll make an incision between the 12th and 13th rib, and that allows them to uh, open this piece up so that they can actually go through and do the grating process. So when they do the grating, what they're actually looking at is the fat or m the marbling that's distributed on the interior of the muscle on this particular piece of meat. But that's between ribs number 12 and 13. 13 marks the beginning of the short loin. The ribeye would be in this area, and then in front of the ribeye you'd have the chuck. But, so we'd have the ribeye here, and then we'd have the short loin, and then we'd have the sirloin behind that. Okay? The cool thing about this, this primal is it has uh, a lot of different steaks that are contained in it. So first and foremost, this is where you'd have your porterhouse. So you can see the T in the T-bone, right? So the T right here, this is a porterhouse steak. So you have a big piece of strip loin, and you have a big piece of tenderloin. As that tenderloin goes back, you can see that it gets skinnier. And the skinnier the tenderloin, the greater its chances of becoming a T-bone steak. So when you have a big, thick piece of tenderloin, you're going to have porterhouse. And when you have a very thin piece of tenderloin, you're going to have a T-bone. Uh, an old school steak that used to be cut from the short loin was called the club steak. And the club steak was the, the first steak that was cut off of here. Um, it had a, a very minuscule amount of tenderloin uh, and also had strip loin on the other side. Who is we are going to actually remove the fillet from this, so we're going to come down. These are called the finger or loin bones. So when you look at the T in a T-bone steak, it looks like this, right? So you've all seen this from one point or another. So this is the T-bone. So this is the classic T. So this is the chine bone. This crevasse is where the uh, spinal cord would go. Feather bones come off the back here. So when you're scratching the, the kind of the hind haunch of a dog, uh, right before their tail. This is where they'd scratch and they'd bend their leg. Um, this is the chine bone on the inside, but this is what makes up the T. So the top of the T is the chine bone, and the bottom or the leg of the T is the finger or loin bone. Over here we have the New York strip, and over here we have the tenderloin. So the first thing that we will do is we will remove that tenderloin. So we're going to come in, and we're going to whoop, locate that finger bone by pulling it back. So I haven't made any cuts. I'm going to come in right against that finger or loin bone, and I'm going to follow that all the way down. So follow that down to the chine bone, and once I hit the chine bone, then I can come down the chine, over the chine, and out. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling that meat back as I go, and I'm coming in as close to that as possible. This is the tenderloin, by far the most expensive piece off of the short loin. So I want to make sure I take that off nice and clean, and I get the highest yield that I can get on that. So by pulling it back this way, I'm going to come in and get as close to those bones as possible. I'm also using a nice flexible boning knife, so you can see I'm getting in there and, and getting a nice bend. And that's going to get me closer to those bones, and everything's going to come out nice and clean. Okay? So, once I have my tenderloin off, I'm going to slide that short loin over out of the way for a second, and we'll come back to that. So now I have my tenderloin off. Uh, now I'm going to clean that tenderloin up, and I'm going to truss it for roasting. So, I'm going to take my fat and any of the extra fat that will just peel off. I'm just going to peel that extra fat off. Okay, now, we've all heard of a Pismo beef tenderloin, and what the P in the Pismo is referring to is the amount of fat on, that's on the outside of the, of the muscle. Um, that P refers to the peeling or removal of the fat, and generally the fat will just peel off. So that's the P, right? The SMO, or side muscle on, is in reference to this muscle right here. Sometimes we call this the chain, um, but we're just going to basically pull it back. When you, if you start to seeing it tear, then you want to, <clears throat> instead of tearing that tenderloin, you want to come in and cut it so we don't jeopardize the integrity of that tenderloin again. All right now, we can come back and clean this up. Uh, this would be tips and tails. Uh, this is trim meat from the chain that we can use in a lot of different applications. Um, what I like to do with it is, is trim it up. Uh, you can cut it into long pieces for doing a satay. It has a good amount of connective tissue in, as you can see. Uh, and generally what I do is I put it into my grind, uh, and I'll use that. But I'll trim off the excess fat. If I'm going to just use it for grind, I'll remove any excess fat and, and uh, visible connective tissue. And then I'll just cube that up for uh, grinding. And then I can say I have tenderloin in my, in my burger. So that goes to my trim for grinding, and all of this fat is going to go to my fat for rendering.
Okay. Now I have my tenderloin almost completely cleaned up. I have a little bit of fat right here, and some of that fat will just peel right off. Okay. And then we want to remove the remaining elastin. This is the elastin here. So what I'm going to do is, is stretch it out. I'm going to come in underneath the elastin, right in the middle, and I'm going to angle my blade into the into the silver skin and take off as little of the meat as possible. And it will generally go down a little bit further. There we go. And we just want to get that off. So um, if you're going against the grain, you're worried about it going against the grain, to fix that, you just go the other way and it smooths it out and makes it look all nice and pretty. Um, so you take all your silver skin off. And once you have your silver skin off, we're going to roll it over. And we're going to look at the underside and see if there's any excess fat. We don't need to trim it super. We're just going to trim a little bit of that fat off so that it's nice and clean. And now when we look at it, now it's a little bit easier to see how we would have a porterhouse. So the way that it came off of, let's go back over here. So the way that it came off of our short loin is we have the thick end where our porterhouse would be. So our porterhouse is over here. You can see that there's the strip, there's the finger or loin bone separating them. And as you see that tenderloin go down, it tapers. So the thick end is where we get a porterhouse, then we get the thin end where we get a T-bone uh, steak and our club steak if we were doing that. Okay? So if I was going to fabricate this into a roast, I'd have one end that's thick, that's going to cook nice, and by the time this gets cooked evenly, this is going to be, you know, not so or not so delicious. So what I do is I'm going to cut about right here, three quarters of the way through, and I'm going to fold it under. Now I could use also a little meat glue. I know that people don't like that, but it makes a really nice steak. So now I get this consistent tenderloin from end to end by putting a little meat glue on here and tying it on. It's going to be a beautiful tenderloin that if I'm doing a catered event or if I'm cutting steaks out of it, I get these beautiful steaks from end to end. So it's just another, another way of increasing your yield and increasing the opportunity to, to sell stuff better. So back to the trussing. So what we're going to do to truss is we are going to take the trussing twine, pop it down, start in the middle. So if my fold goes all the way over here, this is about my middle area. I'm going to start in the middle, fingers over, index finger, ring finger, put it into the crease of my middle finger, put my hand on the table, my left hand, lift my finger up, my middle finger up slightly, turn a loop, open my fingers up to make a loop here, take my finger, grab it, pull that through, cinch it up nice and tight, come back, put a final, a final knot on that, come back there, right? So we'll do that again. So come back here, lead string going down to my bucket. I'm gonna fold my ring finger and pinky over. I'm going to take the string that's coming over into the crease of my middle finger, lift my middle finger up slightly, turn it into a loop, which is the loop where my peace sign is, take the string up, pull it through, cinch it up nice and tight, come back, finish that tie off. Okay. I like to fabricate my tenderloins and leave them as whole as possible, as long as possible. Uh, it's going to increase my shelf life. The more I do to the meat, the more cutting I do on it, the longer or the shorter the shelf life is going to be. So I like to leave it longer. It also allows me flexibility of cutting steaks to order. Um, I might not just have on my menu 10 ounce or 6 ounce or whatever. I might just say, what would you like? Or give me an opportunity to upsell um, with my waitress with my wait staff so um, just a different opportunity to see it slightly differently now you see I missed that part silly I was focused on upselling so come back and we'll get it right here tie that on and this is where that trans the the uh, meat glue comes in kind of handy transglutaminase um, uh, if you do apply transglutaminase or meat glue you don't want to freeze it uh, right away at least. You want to let it sit in your cooler overnight uh, and that will allow it to set up. Um, and now what this allows me to do is I can easily say, uh, you know, here's what my steak looks like. I can easily cut it to size to my, to my guest specifications and I can cut in between each, each twine um, and because it's an independent truss. So there's my tenderloin ready to go. Uh, nice size tenderloin that's going to go to our to our finished pile. Um, all the trim from the butcher swine will go in our compost pile. We'll wipe our table down. We'll get back to that short one. Once we get the short one back on the table, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this 13th rib. So this rib right here, I'm going to pull that out. The easiest way to remove it is coming right against the bone and come down against the bone towards the chine bone. So the chine bone's down here. Okay, I'm going to take that out and I want to pull that chine bone out before I pull my strip loin. 
Now, this is my strip loin. If I wanted to cut a steak out of this, a bone-in steak or a bone-in strip steak would be called a shell steak. It's delicious. Um, you could run this across your bandsaw um, and take that chine bone off, or you could take a bone saw or a cleaver and just kind of clean that chine bone off. Um, and that's what we're going to do there. So we're going to come in and then come in on either side of the bone. So just follow that bone on either side. And I'm basically just coming around it. So that I can pull that out. Okay, and then once I have it free from the rest of the meat, then I can come in here. I can cut. You can see where it's bending down here at the joint. I can cut into that joint. And that bone should start to come out. If it doesn't, it's, when you're doing a demo is when it will not come out. Okay. And then I come back and pull that bone out. Okay? So that's the 13th rib. Uh, and that will go to our bone pile. Okay, so now I'm going to come back and I'm going to remove the strip loin. So to remove the strip loin, I'm going to come back and remove, come in underneath the finger or loin bones, which are right here. Come in underneath the finger or loin bones to the chine bone, and then I'd come out the feather. The feather bones are the ones that come down the back here. Um, it's what give camels and buffalo their humps or their lumps. Um, so this, to put it in perspective, would be the cow lying upside down, right? So imagine your dog, when your dog lays down, it spreads its legs. So this is kind of how the, the cow would be sitting. So if I was scratching its belly, I'd kind of be scratching right up here, scratching its belly. So now I'm going to come in, finger or loin bones. I'm going to get those cleaned and exposed. And I'm going to come in underneath this long finger or loin bone here. And once I come in underneath that, I can start to prop it up. And I can come in right here underneath those bones. Okay, so with each cut that I make, I just want to pull it back a little bit so that I can see it and get a better angle of what I'm doing. It's kind of one of those pieces that's, it's kind of tough to cut because you kind of, you're, you're, I'm going on what I know and not what I can see. So I'm just kind of pull that back so you can see a little bit better up here. So we'll just cut some of this off so we can see that a little bit more cleanly, but can't really see the bones, but there's a bone right here, a finger or loin bone that's right here, and I'm going to come underneath that bone, come underneath this finger or loin bone as well, and I'm just following that up until this is where the bones end, so now I'm going to come down to the chine bone. So now, as I lift it, you can see that I kind of created this little crevice here, and now I can come in at that crevice, once I get my knife in there, and I can pull that down and kind of let gravity be my friend. Okay, so I'm coming down in and I'm trying to get against this bone right here so that I can take that off nice and clean. Okay. So coming in right here, down to the chine bone. Come up here, do the same thing. Down to the chine bone. Now I'm gonna go to the chine and over the chine down to the feather bone. So over that chine, down to the feather bone, and then right out the feather bone. So just keep coming in. So again, I'm going to use my finger and thumb as kind of a pry bar, and I want to get in there nice and close. And the more, the further I go up the loin, the easier it should become, or the more visible my bones should become, rather. So I can see where I need to cut up here a little bit more. And I can put my hand in there, kind of use it as a wedge, and start pulling it back that way. So up here, what I'm trying to do is push that meat back so that as I cut, I'm cutting against the bone, and I'm pulling the meat back 
so that I can come in nice and clean to that chine. So here's my chine. I'll come over the chine, down to the feather, let gravity, hopefully, nope, let gravity help you out. And you can start, now it's starting to kind of fall away as I cut back against the feather. I can also spin it around. So now I can, this is my feather bone right here. And I'm coming against that feather bone and rolling that out. Okay. And I'm just going to follow that up. Keep coming against those bones. I know I'm against the bones because I can hear them. And I, I know that my knife is, is going flexible against the bones. Okay. So just keep following that up. And now I am at the end of the feather bone. So I can start to cut that off. I can turn it a little bit more and just start cutting that completely off. All right, and so there's the lumbar vertebrae from the short loin. Um, so here would be kind of how it's positioned in the animal. So this is the feather bone. This is where the strip loin came from. These are the finger or loin bones here. Underneath would be where the tenderloin is located. This is the chine bone, okay? And this would be the lumbar vertebrae of the short line or the, of the animal. <coughs> All right, so now we can come back and look at the short loin again. So we just want to come back and clean it up. So this is a strip loin. This is the, the piece that you would cut New York strips from. Um, it's a, a great piece. The, the thing that sometimes is challenging to people is the connected tissue, sometimes called the nerve, but it's not a nerve. It's actually a thick band of connective tissue. You can see it right here comes down to the end as well. So the end that's closest to the ribeye is going to have less of that band of connective tissue. And the end that's closest to the sirloin is going to have the thickest part of that. Okay? So there is our short loin. Uh, and now we're going to cut it to cut a New York strip, strip steak. New York strip, Kansas City strip are the same thing. So it just depends on where you're at, I guess. Um, so if I'm cutting steaks, I don't trim the fat off uh, and I, I like to leave it whole. And you can see we, it, how it came off when they cut on that 12th rib. Um, that's where it kind of has that weird angle. So you kind of got to go at the angle that the, that the primal is giving you to cut your steaks out. So we're going to flip it over this way and we're going to kind of pull it in and we're going to cut our steaks from there. All right, when you're cutting it, when you're cutting your steaks, again, I like to, my, I personally like to cut nice thick steaks. Uh, other people like to cut them a little bit thinner. You want a nice sharp knife so that you can do a nice long stroke. Hopefully you don't want to do little strokes and that's where a longer knife really comes in handy because you can get a nice long stroke going through that and cut that off nice and uh, clean. So this is the end closest to the sirloin and you can tell from that thick band of connective tissue that's in there. So we'll hand shape them as they come off. Um, and now you can see that that looks more like a New York strip. You can see that thick band that comes from the end. All right, and we're just going to cut those to steaks. So nice thick steaks, nice and uniform. And then here is a good example of, now you're going to end up with this thin piece on the end. So I'm not going to jeopardize the thickness of my big steak. So I'm going to cut a little piece off the end here. So that I maintain a nice thick steak on, the, on that throughout. Um, this I could sell as a, a skinny or smaller portion, uh, or I could trim it out, or I could throw it on the grill and eat it. That would probably be a 
challenging idea, right? So um, but that's what we're going to get out of that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take them and trim them up just like we did before. Um, I like to, I, I don't like this kind of that band of connected tissue in here, so I, I cut that out. I'm going to trim these up just a little bit. Look at both sides, make sure that it's nice and clean. And all the fat is going to go to the fat line. All right, so what we'll get out of the short loin is we'll get New York strip steaks, nice thick cut New York strip steaks, um, going from the ribeye end and going back to the sirloin end. We'll get the tenderloin itself, which you can cut steaks from. We'll get the trim for grinding. We'll get bones we can use for roasting, uh, including the last rib bone. And then we can get fat that we can use for rendering uh, to make tallow or to make soap or whatever. And there you have the short loin.